I'm going to talk about um, this idea of killer questions that every business leader should ask. And uh, these questions are based on my personal experience. I've been a management consultant um, since the late 1990s. I was a, uh, an Oxford Don, you know, what, what do you call it? A, professor of literature and philosophy in Oxford and then I moved into business and um, I, what I'm doing really is talking about my experience of what it's like to have consulted to quite a lot of businesses in that, in that time and to see the mistakes and the successes they're making. So this is a very, you know, this is based on experience. It's more experiential than theoretical, if you like. But it is based on being with lots of different companies, <coughs> companies and uh, public sector organisations. So by business leader, I mean leader in the sense of having a business to run, whether it's a public business or a private business, but that sense of having something uh, that you're in charge of. Uh, it's not just for chief executives. I mean, I do most of my work now is with chief executives and senior management teams and boards. But by leader, I mean, uh, I guess anybody who's got a substantial responsibility uh, in any organisation, really, uh, of any size. So it's not just chief executives. Um, my starting point for this um, really goes back to one of my first ever consulting assignments. Uh, when I was in I, the first firm I worked for, uh, so I worked for a, a small firm in London, then I, I used to run a, uh, another firm in London, now I'm independent. But I, in one of my first ever consulting assignments, I was with the board of the Ministry of Defence. I guess you uh, probably have an equivalent, I imagine, in, in Lithuania of some kind. Anyway, the Ministry of Defence in London is made up of uh, or was made up at the time, of the three chiefs of the defence staff. So you've got the leader of the army, the leader of the navy, and the leader of the air force. And uh, also people who run the organisation as well. So, And I was um, facilitating the discussion, or helping to facilitate the discussion uh, between the people in the room. And uh, one of the people in the room was getting quite frustrated because we were talking about organisational issues rather than big strategic issues. And um, he wanted to get the conversation back to the subject of war. Fair enough, it's the Ministry of Defence. And we ended up talking about uh, military strategy as opposed to business strategy. And you know the word business strategy gets used a lot and it's based on a Greek word uh, for meaning general, you probably know this. So when businesses talk about strategy they're, they're often unwittingly taking over a military concept. Anyway, this man said, um, it's a phrase I've never forgotten, he said, no strategy survives contact with the enemy. No strategy survives contact with the enemy. Right? So whatever you do in terms of strategic planning, in the army in this case, um, it will be blown apart, literally, if not metaphorically, as soon as action starts. So no strategy is powerful enough to withstand what happens afterwards. And in fact, subsequently, as you probably know, um, a lot of strategy these days uh, in, in the military world isn't really strategy at all. It's, it's, um, it's adaptation techniques. It's how you adapt to what Clausewitz called the fog of war. And the point of war is that it's so confusing, so chaotic, that uh, you know, any attempt at strategy is doomed to failure up to a point. So it's better to prepare yourself in whatever way you can for confusion and to create confusion, because this is the way in which war generally works. War is not the kind of orderly progression of strategies. Now, I'm no military theorist, so that's where the, <laughs> that's where the warfare discussion stops. But this notion that um, no strategy survives contact with the enemy st stayed with me. 
And it stayed with me particularly because I was consulting in an environment where people would talk about strategy a lot. So I'd be working alongside strategy consultants, for example, as well as organisation consultants. And it struck me then and it strikes me now that, again, strategy is a rather, uh, not a weak, but it's, it's by no means the only tool you need in business. Because, as in the military, most strategies find that they run up against the reality of what it's like to be in a market, to run an organisation and so on. So strategy meets reality in a very visceral way in businesses. And I um, have sort of come to the conclusion that it's much better to prepare businesses for reality than it is to perfect their strategy. And this is what I want to talk about today, how you prepare businesses for reality rather than perfect the strategy. Because you can create perfect strategies. There are some brilliant strategies. Uh, there are great books about strategy. There are classic texts. I mean, uh, the mo probably the most classic text is the Michael Porter. Do you know this? The Porter's Five Forces. It's kind of standard business school fare. Great book, great concept, and up to a point it works, of course. You know, when you're talking about entering a market, and you want to know what your competitive strategy is, Porter's Five Forces are a very good checklist. You know, you go through the barriers to entry and the bargaining power of suppliers, the bargaining power of customers and so on. You know, absolutely excellent. Unfortunately, the reality of business is that you're not in a strategy space anymore. You're in a business space and the business space is quite different from the strategy space. The reality of running a business and dealing with the politics internally, sometimes the politics externally. If you run a big company, if you run British Petroleum, you're dealing with politics with a big P. These things are much greater factors than your strategy is likely uh, to be able to prepare you for. So what I'm talking about today is, is the reality of business that the, as I've seen it and how that outflanks and limits the power of any strategy you might be able to create for a business. And I framed it um, in terms of what I call killer questions. So these are real questions that businesses should ask uh, in order to survive. Because it's quite easy to ask the strategy questions like, what's our market? What's our market share going to be? What kind of return on our investment do we want? What acquisitions do we wish to make? Those questions, they're quite easy, they're quite easy questions, they're quite generic questions. You know, and in a way anybody can answer them. And it's quite interesting that most businesses, it's quite interesting that most businesses actually don't put their strategy function at the top of the organization. If you look at most businesses, the chief strategy person is probably not on the senior management team even. Okay, the, 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 the person who's most senior in an organization, as we know, is the chief executive officer, and you'll probably have some operations officer, some sales or marketing type thing, uh, and you'll have an HR, back office, finance, and so on. It's very rare to have a strategy person actually on the senior management team of an organization. And that, for me, says something about what it's really like to run a business, that actually strategy doesn't necessarily uh, have the top say. And better, therefore, to ask the questions that strategy doesn't ask. And I, I mean, uh, I'll come on to the questions, but then just another way of thinking about it is that in any case, most strategies actually result in a very few options. Most strategies lead you to one of very few actions. Grow. Our strategy is to grow. It's the most common. You can express it how you want to. But it's the most common strategy of all. We want to grow. We want more. Okay? That's the most common strategy. And there are a few others. There's grow, divest. We've got too big. We've grown, now we're too big. Diversify. We've grown. We can't grow like that anymore. We want to grow like that. Okay, so you've got grow, divest, diversify, or focus, which is another way of expressing uh, divesting. You know, you focus in, and maybe consolidate, which is 
Times are tough, let's just batten down the hatches, which is a very common business model at the moment, particularly in Europe, as you know. Times are tough. Consolidate is really, a, you know, if you look at most strategies these days, consolidate is really the center of them. So most strategies actually lead you to a very limited number of actions, a very limited number of steps. And yet when you step back and you look at the market, uh, the market is full of companies which are either succeeding or failing, or somewhere in between the two. So if you ask yourself, well, how is it that there can be such a range of success and so few strategies that people are following, you've got to reach the conclusion that it's not the strategies that make the difference here. It's not really the strategies that are making the difference between success and failure. It's probably something else. Because the number of strategies pursued are quite limited, quite narrow, quite unvarying and quite generic. And you look at the marketplace, the market fills up with companies doing more or less the same thing. And more or less the, more or less the same thing in a very limited number of ways. Grow, diverse, diversify and so on. So it's not that that's necessarily making the difference. What is it that's making the difference? Well, in my experience, it's things like the company ran out of energy. The leaders were too vain to heed any advice. Um, there were people trying to sabotage the organization from within. You know, these are the real things that go on in business that strategies don't project or take account of. And yet they're the things in my experience that really make the difference. So better therefore to base your strategy on what really happens than on a few genuine, generally too rational principles that strategy is based upon. Strategy tends to be too rational to be able to cope with reality. So um, I'm going to give you, um, I'm going to talk through some of these questions. The book I'm working on has 48 of these. I won't, <laughs> I won't go through all of them, but I will, I'll give you, I'll read out some of them and I'll go into some detail. So I ask sort of some basic questions like, why does your business exist? Okay, there is a, there's a fundamental kind of business existentialism. You'll be surprised how many people can't answer that question. I interview a lot of senior executives. I say, why does your business exist? Most of them say, well, uh, to make money? Okay, fine. But then if you ask the next question, which is, do you love money? Okay, it's a very good question to ask in a business. Do you love money? What you get is a very odd collection of answers because in some cases you get people who are uncomfortable with the idea of loving money. They feel it's something morally wrong about loving money. At the other end of the spectrum you get people who are greedy and love money too much and they too have an exaggerated and immature relationship to money. And these two ends of the spectrum are quite common people who have, not, who have not reconciled themselves to money one way or the other. They are, they're either don't love it enough or they love it too much. And yet, if you don't have a mature relationship to money, you are not going to succeed in business. You need to have an appropriate sense, an appropriate love of money. Without that, your business is not going to succeed. It has to be an appropriate, it's fine to love money. Money is a resource, it's a power, it's an asset. It drives the economy. It drives personal success, it drives ambition, and so on. it motivates people. And it's the lifeblood of business. But I'm amazed by the number of executives who are uncertain about it, They're made to feel very anxious when you ask them about... If I ask them that question, do you love money? It's a killer question. Because they don't, they don't know, they don't quite know how they feel. It's, and yet a lot of businesses trip up because of this. So, to put it in very practical terms, um, if you ask people, how much is enough? This is another killer question. So how much is enough? More. More. Well, uh, more is not always the answer to the question. Now, let's take the example of Virgin. You know Virgin, which is run by Richard Branson, Virgin Airlines, Coke, and so on, yeah? Now, um, I did a little bit of consulting for um, Virgin in the, 
quite a long time ago. And uh, Richard Branson is at the center of that business, and he surrounds himself with ex-consultants, actually. And Richard Branson's business model, are any of you, do any of you work for uh, Virgin, ever work for Virgin? Have this, had this experience? Well, Branson himself is like this. He would, you know, apparently he wants to go up and up and up and just keep getting onto the next acquisition and so on. The role of the consultants around him is to put a break on it and say, no, no, you can't, it's too much, we can't, it's too fast. We've got to bank what we've got and then move on. Except it's not really like that. If you look at the Virgin business model, what Branson wants to do is not just have more and more and more. What the motivation is, is to be uh, a David to a Goliath. So what he wants to do in any market is to go into a market, identify the incumbent, and kill it. Right? That's, that's what he wants. Enough for Branson is to go into a market, identify the incumbent, and kill it. So Virgin Atlantic, it's in the news last week, Virgin wants to go in and kill British Airways. Yeah, that's what it wants to do. Enough for Branson is to have killed British Airways. It's not more, it's in a market to displace the incumbent and then move on to the next market. You know, Virgin Wines or whatever it might be, and displace the incumbent there. Enough for Branson is this, it's a psychological need. You know, what's enough for you, Richard? It's enough for me if I can get into the market and displace the big kid on, big kid on the block because there's something in my psyche that really gets to me about being the small guy and having a big guy. And I love the idea of being the small guy who displaces the big guy. I love it. I am obsessed with it. It's, in, it's deep in my unconscious. I can't get, a, can't get it out of my system. So the question of enough is quite interesting in that case. It's not more. And in fact, if your answer to the question, how much enough, is simply more, you're going to be in an endless cycle of dissatisfaction. It's, it's always going to ever recede. I'll give you another example. I did some work for, it's a very peculiar piece of work, for a, an English lord who hired me to help him think about his estate. You know, poor chap, he had uh, you know, a stately home, he owned a village, he owned uh, you know, it, it, lots and lots of different investments, oil paintings, other artworks, gardens, I mean, uh, an extraordinary, you know, which he'd inherited from his father, who'd inherited it from his father and so on. And this family line stretched back, uh, stretched back to the middle of the 15th century, okay? And I, I was talking to him about his, you know, his strategy. And I said, well, how much is enough? His answer was, I just want to preserve it. I just want to preserve it. Enough for me is to be able to pass this on to my son. That for me is enough. And, it, and it's exactly what his father's ambition had been before him and his grandfather's ambition and so on. Enough was that. He was very clear about it and very successful and the estate was beautifully managed. But he had a very, very clear sense of what enough meant and it wasn't more. So this notion that enough has to be calibrated with more needs to be disrupted. Two very good examples there, I think. Richard Branson, enough for him is not, it's more, it's, you know, the motivation is profound in it. When, what is that motivation? It's the motivation to be the David to a Goliath. And that's the thing which he has tapped into and has been this extraordinary source of energy for him for, you know, two or three decades now. And, you know, I think this is a question for every business leader. What is your enough? What, you know, what would it be? If I was coach, I'm a, I coach chief executives, and I ask them, you know, what is your enough? What's enough? And um, there was a bit of research done in the UK recently about people's earnings, you know, just a, a, like a kind of focus group. And people said, how much is enough for you in terms of salary? And whether you were earning 10,000 pounds a year or 100,000 pounds or a million pounds a year, the average answer was twice what I'm currently earning, <laughs> right? A kind of almost, you know, universe, it was twice, you know, I'm on 10,000 pounds, but if I had 20,000, <sighs> I could breathe, <laughs> right? I'm on a million pounds a year, but <sighs> so, 
not quite enough. I'm anxious about the school fees, the, that car, the second home. It, call it two million and we'll be fine. You know? <sighs> That'll be fine. Um, so that, you know, this notion of taking a monetary value for what enough is may not be the best one. It's, it may be better to find the psychological equivalent of what enough is. Because in the case of Richard Branson, in the case of this lord I worked with, it was profound in there. It was profound. And that profound sense was a much better navigator than I need to earn twice what I'm earning at the moment. So the question of, en of enough is, is quite an important one. Um, now, I'm going to start. That was all a preamble. <laughs> so one of the questions I, um, I, I ask businesses is not about the future. Most businesses are completely fixated on the future. Like, what's the growth plan? What's the acquisition strategy? What's the revenue target for next year? They're all, most businesses are nearly all future focused, and quite rightly. And most business books are all, you know, getting to the future first, you know, you know innovation in 2050, the 2020 mindset, you know. And rightly so. But there is a, uh, there's a weakness involved in that. So for, uh, I'm just uh, starting a piece of work with uh, an advertising company in London. Okay, they've hired me to work with their board. And I've uh, done a few interviews with the top brass. And when I talk to people, I always get the family history. I always get the business history. You know, more or less whatever question I ask, it's like, ah, oh, yes, but in 1998, or... You know, in 1991, we did... The, I said, but hang on, I was just asking you about your revenue target for next year. You know, I'm always taken back into the history of the business. Now, whenever you go into a business as a consultant, you get lots of information of all kinds, right? But the moment you walk in the door, it can be anything from how long you're asked to wait in the, you know, in the executive suite, to whether you're offered tea and coffee, to you know, whether the appointment's on time, you know, so there's all sorts of information you get, and all of it counts, every single drop. If any of you are going into consultancy, want my one tip for you, notice everything. Absolutely everything is data, okay? And particularly those of you who go into strategy consulting jobs, there's data, which is financial data, but that's only the tip of the iceberg. You know, notice everything. Everything in a business is, in, is rich information. Everything. And in this business, I've, I've been struck by the, you know, I'm just in the middle of this project. People talk about the past all the time. Now, it turns out that um, this business is a very successful business. Um, it's doing very well. But that it... Uh, although it's got great client relationships, it's advertising copy is bought by lots of firms. It's got a great reputation. It's considered... Do you ever watch Mad Men? Have you seen that? Uh, okay. They kind of have their own resident Don Draper there. You know, sort of charming, brilliant, creative guy, you know, around, the whole, around whom the whole business is kind of engineered. You know, the, the creative director. So they have no problem selling... Um, advertising, you know, selling their advertising to clients, winning pitches. You know, they're, they're, they're a great advertising agency. But they are crap at running themselves, okay? Absolutely terrible. They lose money, they've nearly been bankrupt several times. They have um, squandered money, they spent excessive amounts on themselves, they bought incredibly fancy offices, far bigger than they needed in central London. You know, they bought an office big enough for whatever it was, 300 people when there were just 50 of them. You know, they're just hopeless with money. You know, they're great at getting it, but unfortunately they've got holes in their pockets. So, you know, they, they take all this money in and it just goes straight through because they're, they're, their financial management, their internal financial management is terrible. So what's the connection between that and this history story I keep getting? Well. The business was set up by two partners, not unusual in advertising. One man who has stayed there ever since um, and is the kind of alpha male, if you like. And the other guy who left quite early on 
uh, who was the finance director. So they set up as the kind of the creative director on the one hand and the finance director, very common arrangement for an advertising business, right? Creative guy and the finance guy, the accounts guy. The creative guy was brilliant, he's the Don Draper figure and he stayed there and he's still there, still being brilliant. But the finance guy was a disaster, right? He was an original founding partner of this firm. And he, you know, right from the beginning, it was all going wrong. And he left within about, I think it was about 18 months. This was 25 years ago. And still, people are saying, this is a great business, but we're terrible with money, right? To this day. And I got, I've gone back, and it's been the case ever since the late 80s. What's going on with that business? There is something in the, uh, the founding of that business, something in the origins of that business that hasn't been dealt with. That, you know, there is some founding bias in it which hasn't been flushed out. So the question, that, the question I put here is, was there a star at the birth of your organization? Was there a star? You know, what were the auspices like? What was actually happening? What was, what was happening at the beginning of your organization that is still continuing to happen? Because this organization is playing out what the relationship that happened in the late 80s between these two men. It's playing it out now, 2012, 30 years later. It is still the same dynamic, exactly the same dynamic right now. So this business has not worked out the place of this hidden founder. And I say, well, what's happened to him now? You know, where is he? Nobody knows. Okay? He disappeared from the... He went AWOL. We don't know. We don't know where he is. But this business is haunted by him. Absolutely haunted. I mean, literally haunted. You know, and it keeps repeating things from the past because it hasn't dealt with this guy. <coughs> it doesn't know how to deal with it. And because he's... When he's spoken of, it's sort of dismissively. It's like, oh, he was, cra he was crazy. You know? He was a... I won't tell you what they say about him, but because they don't, they've not taken account of him, because they've not respected him, they haven't found a place for him, a respectful place, effectively. He was a founding partner, he was one of two founders. He haunts that business, I mean literally, and that business has been stuck in a pattern of repetition ever since. So it's a very good question to ask. If those of you who run businesses or go on to run businesses pay a lot of attention to what happened at the beginning. It's like in chaos theory, do you know this, what they call the sensitive dependence upon initial conditions? Have you heard of this? What happens early on, you know, if it's not dealt with in some way, will just continue to repeat. Businesses have patterns in the same way human beings do, and they come back and haunt them. Is, uh, is this okay so far? Do you, yeah, are you getting enough? Yeah, okay. Um, okay. Next question. Would you rather suffer than change? Would you rather suffer than change? Now, um, I did some work with a boutique law firm who um, every year would say, uh, we, we want to we grow, okay? Because it was a small practice. There were about 30 people, 20 partners. And uh, their business was selling premium legal services to premium clients in the City of London for premium fees. You know, they were charging a lot of money and doing very well, so their margins were high. But every year they said, you know, it came to the annual planning process, the team away day. And they said, oh, but yeah, but we want to grow. You know, we've been 20, 20, 25, 30 people for years. You know, we want to grow. Okay. Um, every time they grow, every time they grew a bit and they they thought the only way to grow was to go to more leverage, basically, so to move away from the premium model to one of more junior people doing more transactional legal services for lower price. You know, a classic shift from, you know, that end of the uh, graph to that end of the graph. You know, they're going from Prada to Primark is that sort of transition. That's where they wanted to go. Every time they went a bit further down that uh, that graph from Prada to Primark, one of the partners would leave. Right? It was you, know, you could see it. It was like clock. You know, and I, I know this firm because one of my closest friends, is, you know, was in it. So he'd tell me every year. I'd say, so has anybody left this year? Yep, another partner. Have you grown at all this year? Yeah, we grow a little bit. You know, it's absolutely uh, 
they were absolutely tagged to each other. Because every year they asked themselves the question, do we want to grow? Yes, we want to grow. How much do we want to grow by? We want to grow by, you know, 10%. Okay. The question they failed to answer, the question they failed to ask even was, but do we want to change? They said, do we want to grow? They never asked themselves the question, do we want to change? Okay, everybody wants to grow. Do you want to change? Very different proposition. And actually, in their case, they would rather suffer than change. They would rather suffer that ongoing attrition, the sense of not meeting their ambitions, than actually change anything. Because the change was anathema to them. It was a premium business. You know, it was nice. It was nice boutique, classy, London, you know, Oxbridge types. It was a very nice business. They were all making a good, good amount of money. And it was really only a sort of sense that, uh, a sense that somehow they could be earning a lot more without really having to change the business model. Well, you can't have your cake and eat it. The key question they hadn't asked was this, you know, do you want to grow? Yep. Do you want to change? No. Okay. So this question, would you rather suffer than change, uh, for me is one of the it's one of the key ones, and again, I mean, all firms talk about change all the time. You know, we need to change this and that. But, do, you know, do you want to change? You know, people are invested more often in the, in the default than in the, than in the future. So that's another question. I'll, I'll give you some more examples. Um, yeah, please. Why change? Why change? Yes, because if they are growing, so they are changing in terms of volume. Well, they weren't really. I mean, they were changing a tiny bit. Partners. Sorry? In terms of volume, in terms of partners, they are changing. They were changing slightly. I mean, it was incremental. I mean, really incremental. And every time they took on two more junior people, one of the senior people would go. So, you know, they were kind of... The, the business model... I mean, this is classic. This is classic strategy stuff. I mean, you need to decide if you're going to be Primark or Prada. Those people who try and go halfway between the two, find it's a very, very hard road to make work. It's the same as, um, I met some guys, you know the jeans company Wrangler? I met some guy, the marketing director recently, and uh, he, you know, they're suffering because they are absolutely in the middle of that. They are neither high end, that, you know, they're not, well, you know, whatever, the most expensive, they're not Prada and they're not Primark, they're right in the middle. It's very, very hard business to sustain, especially as their demographic is, um, you know, it's not cool and they want to be cool. You know, people who buy Wrangler jeans are, t you know, tend to be 40 plus, you know, it's f which is a fine market. But it's, it's very hard. So they keep saying, oh, we want to, you know, should we make more cool jeans and charge 170 pounds, you know, 200 euros for them? Or should we, you know, do cheap ones? And of course, they never quite decide and they get stuck in the middle and they, you know, they spend their time just, you know, like this. This is the feeling in that business. It's like, what should we do? Of course, what they should really do is go with their strength. They have a demographic there. You know, it's not cool. People who wear Wrangler jeans aren't cool. Wrangler jeans aren't cool. But there are plenty of uncool people that are ready to, ready to buy uncool jeans. You know, it's a good market. You know, if somebody was offering Wrangler for sale, you should buy it. It's a good, it's a good market. You know, but they feel partly because they're in the jeans business, they feel they feel they should be cooler than they are. Hang on, we're selling jeans. We're not cool. Something's gone wrong here. You know, but uncool jeans is a valid proposition. Uncool jeans for uncool people. <laughs> it's a great strap line. Um, my next question. Um, do you, do you know um, Ricky Gervais in The Office? Uh, remember The Office, the British comedy? He always has this phrase, there's no I in team. Have you heard that? You know, the team, we're all a team here, there's no I in team, there's no letter I. In other words, there's no, me, there's no room for people who aren't team players here, okay? Um, so my question is, are you sure there's no I in team? Um, I want to come at this through the work of uh, Elliot Jack, have you come across him, a kind of management guru? Because um, he writes a bit about teams, and my observation is that most businesses set up a team regardless of whether they need one. Okay? The instinct to set up a team is one of the most knee-jerk things in any business. It's like, we've got a problem, I'll tell you what, let's set up a team. Oh, we've got a team! 
Great, the problem's going to go away. Now we have a team. Okay? Um, and it doesn't just happen in private sector organisations, it happens in uh, government. So, uh, under the last Labour administration in Britain, there was this report that said uh, Britain, isn't in it, Britain isn't innovative enough. What did they do? Set up an innovation team. <laughs> That'll do it. And of course the innovation team sits there in a government department reporting to other civil servants and ministers. I mean, it's not going to be very innovative under those circumstances, right? Anyway, I'm not here to bash that. But the point is, you know, why is team always an answer? Why is the, what is this thing about teams? Well, one of the things that Elliot Jack hints at is that the notion of the team, just as businesses <coughs> like to imitate military strategy, they love to imitate and talk about sports, right? Team player pulling together. It's, it's kind of relentless and rather boring aspect of business, all this team talk and sport talk. And um, what he says is, the, the emphasis on team is, I mean, he doesn't say this, I'm extrapolating, but the emphasis on team and business is uh, kind of political. You know, it's a way of trying to reflect democratic politics inside businesses. You know, in the Western world, there are democracies. We think democracies are a good thing. Everybody has their say. The equivalent in businesses is a team. Yeah? Bring everybody together, harness diverse views, you'll be stronger together than you would be apart. This is the kind of philosophy of teams, right? That's the whole point of a team. And uh, one person's weaknesses are compensated by somebody else's strength, and so on and so forth. Teams, self-evidently good, and a reflection of democratic principles. Well, in my experience, uh, there are very, very few teams. I mean, I've seen lots of things that call themselves teams. Very few of them actually are. Because a team, to be a team, needs to have a genuine level of interdependence, right? In other words, I can't do my job unless he's doing his job too, yeah? So you need, uh, you need the two together. But most teams in most organisations are just groups. They're just groups. So I just uh, uh, got a remortgage on my house in London, okay? I was put through to Team Canberra on my... Uh, cooperative bank, right? Broken down into team. Different teams work with different cases. It's Team Canberra who's working on my case. They call themselves after different Australian cities for some reason. Team Canberra. There's a Team Melbourne and Team Brisbane and Team Perth and Team Adelaide. I get Team Canberra. Fine. Team Canberra is working on your case. What does that mean? Actually, it's just this one guy who happens to be in a group of other people who are dealing with mortgage applications from people whose surnames go from M to Z. <laughs> right? That's Team Canberra. There's not a lot of team spirit in Team Canberra. Team Canberra. It's not, there's no interdependence. But the worst aspect of it is that, you know, in most teams, what you get is, and we know this, I mean, if you, certainly I experienced it, teaching seminars in university, you're in a group, the philosopher Kant says this, you're in a group and suddenly you feel you don't have responsibility. It's an automatic thing, you're in a group, you're not responsible anymore. You can sit in the seminar, somebody else is going to talk, that's fine, I'm, I'll sit here, that's fine, it's okay. Nobody's going nobody's to hold me to account, I'm just sitting here. Okay, it's a group, okay, it's fine. Nobody need take responsibility. And Elliot Jack's serious point here is that an organisation, a business, exists to do work. This is the fundamental purpose of a business. A business exists to do work. And if that's the case, you have to ask yourself, next question, what is it that most facilitates the doing of work in a business? What is it that helps work get done, more than anything else? And he says, ownership of the work. The sense that somebody is owning it, wholly owning it. Like, you can w imagine the work literally as an object, or the buck, you know, where does the buck stop? I don't actually know what a buck is in that, con in that saying, but anyway, whatever a buck is, it's a thing. Imagine work as a thing, you know, a ball or whatever you want. You, you pass that ball into the team, and the team just look at the ball. <coughs> is that all right? Okay, whose is it? It's not owned. 
This is the big risk in teams. It's the lack of ownership of the work. Because when the work is owned, people then pass it on. It's, it's cared for. It has a home. It has a place. And the work can be passed through the organisation. Interestingly, Jacques also relates this to how hierarchies work in organisations. And he says, if you're a business leader, you need to be able to look down your business, like looking down a well or a mine shaft, and you need to see the person at every level of the organisation who has got the work. Yeah? You need to see who's got it. Who? Not where. Who? Which, which person? You know, is it Sam? Is it Sally? Because only then do you know that work is being owned and accountability is being held for it. And the trouble with the team is that it threatens this notion of accountability. This is the problem with it. So, you know, are you sure there's no I in team? Is a team always the answer? I'll uh, give you some more examples. Um, okay, here's a very good question. Are there any spies? Now, uh, I just came from the KGB museum <laughs> this afternoon. In fact, it's taken me a little while to recover, I have to say. But, um, are there any spies? Um, and I'll stop in a minute. When my, my uncle used to be the uh, chief technology officer for Mars, the confectionery company, yeah, they make Mars bars and chocolate. Before that, he worked for Cadbury's, which is a rival uh, chocolate maker in the UK. On the day he got the job at Mars, he went to his boss at Cadbury's and said, I got this job at Mars. Not good news, you can imagine, to impart to his boss. They said, turn around, get out of the building now. Right, like that. He wasn't allowed to go back to his desk. No, it was instant. He was marched, literally marched out of the building, right there and then. Because from that second, in the moment of announcing this, he was seen as a spy. You know, and the very fact he'd been through a recruitment process with the competitor meant that he probably was, kind of because he was party to, let's call them industrial secrets to make it sound a bit more juicy. And um, he was kicked out. But it's, this story has always struck me because I think of a complete opposite to this. Since I was talking about strategy consulting firms, if you think about McKinsey, you, you'll know McKinsey, the consulting firm. I think McKinsey are... Um, First and foremost, not a strategy business, but a recruitment agency. And I say this very seriously, not just because they take recruitment so seriously, and they really do, as some of you will know, but because when they recruit people, they recruit people not just for their time at McKinsey, but for life. They recruit people for life, basically. And they know when they're hiring people, they are hiring their future clients. You know, and this is partly why recruitment is so important in McKinsey, and it's an extraordinarily successful and wonderful business. They are hiring their future clients, because they know they are having people inside that organisation who will then go on and become, probably, pretty successful business people. And their model, therefore, is not to treat these people as spies, but actually as part of a larger community. Even if they go on and work with competitors, they see them as part of a wider network, a wider resource, which continues even after they've left the firm, as they call it. So you can think of so-called spies as potential resources. And I think for business leaders, this is a quite a, it's quite a profound point in some ways, because you get used to the idea that they're your people. Like, here's my organizer, you know, here's my empire. You know, I run an empire of, I just heard about this, um, Chinese firm, the director of operations has one million people reporting to him. <laughs> Can you imagine? It's <laughs> unbelievable, isn't that the scale of that? Can you imagine how big's your team? Well, oh, a million. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, extraordinary, and huh? the scale. But you get used to this idea that they're kind of yours. You forget the idea that, like when we go, you've had this experience, you've been in a business, you see what's going on, and you're thinking about your future. You know, you, you're picking up stuff. You know, it's experience that you're picking up. And if you're a leader, you've got people who are all stealing from you. 
all of the time. They're stealing ideas. That's what, it's, it's what you've got in a business. People are stealing all that. They may not be stealing laptops, but they're stealing <laughs> ideas. You know, they're stealing experiences. They are gathering stuff. They're harvesting stuff. But you don't have to take the Mars approach to that. You can take the McKinsey approach to that, which is to say, OK, and we'll give people this stuff. And if we keep people in the tent, that resource remains with us. They're part of our collective community. They, become, they remain an asset. They don't become even competitors subsequently. So are there any spies for me? Is what, it's, a, it's a great question to ask of a business. I'm just conscious of time, so I'll, um, uh, I'll just ask uh, one last question. This is one question I ask, because um, I coach some chief, chief executives. I often ask them this question and they turn pale. I say, are you 100% productive 100% of the time? <laughs> and it's a very good question, right? It's, it's a very good question. Is anybody in the room here, by the way, 100% productive 100% of the time? <laughs> Have you, have you met an, uh, at least one person? I haven't met at least one person, no. Uh, I don't know what percentage I have met. So are you 100% productive 100% of the time? Well, no. Nobody is. I mean, this is astonishing. I mean, when I... Well, I don't know if it's your experience. My experience is that some days I can get loads done. My to-do list, I'm on top of it, I'm on to the next thing, I'm making calls, I'm writing stuff. You know, the to-do list... <laughs> You know, it's, it's nothing. It's nothing. And I just, other days, two hours have gone. The very first thing on my to-do list hasn't been done. I've had an extra cup of coffee. I've gone for a little walk. I've maybe played a game on my iPhone. <laughs> you know, it's just the contrast is extraordinary. You know, and I don't think I'm particularly unusual. I think we all have this hugely wide range of personal productivity, especially if you work in a service industry. I mean, I think if you're working in a factory, it's rather different. You know, you're almost literally driven to be productive, you know. Anyway, um, it strikes me there are two kinds of non-productivity. There's good non-productivity and there's bad non-productivity. Uh, bad non-productivity is sitting there thinking, oh, I really should be doing something and I'm not. But that game of computer chess is just so compelling. I'm just going to do that, <laughs> that next move, okay? This is my current addiction, computer chess. So, um, that's bad productivity. When I say to people, okay, well, go to the art gallery. If you're not bu busy, go and look at some paintings. Go and listen to some music. Meditate. Do some yoga. Go for a swim. The resistance is... is almost overwhelming. What do you mean? Go and I can't say, but I'm going to be playing computer chess. What do you mean? I can't go out and... So, you know, the resistance to the idea of actually using that time differently is extraordinarily high. And yet, if you ask senior people where they get their ideas from, they don't get them from inside their organisations most of the time. They don't get them from being in their business. They get them on a Saturday afternoon when they happen to be watching their kids play and they think... Oh, right, I've seen that differently. I see something there which is different. Or they'll hear a piece of music which will remind them of something in their childhood and will help them to unravel a kind of sticky business problem. You know, that's where these things come from. And if you're stuck at work, you know, you're not going to solve it by staying at your desk and just carrying on doing it. And, I mean, I can't tell you how many senior executives I talk to who say, I wish I had more time for culture, right? But I wor I'm working, you know, I'm up at six, I'm home at nine. I don't, you know, well, I don't have any time. When would I have time? Come on, don't be, you're being crazy. When would I have time to go to the theatre or visit an art gallery? And yet, you ask them where they get their ideas from, they're almost always from those environments. So the message is, you know, t to build time in for those. So I'm going to stop just because you know, time is, is short. Um, there are, of these questions, I've just given you a, a, a smattering. What I've tried to develop, there's about 48 questions that for me are the real questions that, of what it's really like to be in a business. And the pitfalls, the politics, the agonies, um, the undiscussable things, the taboos, the realities that most strategy thinking doesn't get you into. 
you know, most planning doesn't get you into. But if you ask these questions of a business, you know, why do you exist? When will your organization die? Ask that. That's a very good question to ask of a business leader. When will your organization die? Will it go to heaven? <laughs> you know? These are very good questions because these are the, these are the important questions. You know, when will your organization die? We know organizations have life cycles. If you think about the dot-com boom in the 90s, if you remember that, knowledge economy, making money out of knowledge, well, most businesses had no idea uh, you know, how things would evolve at all. So when they actually matured, those that survived, they found themselves not with you know, cool startup issues, but with five-year-old, rather ordinary management issues. Like, what should we do with this person? Or do we need a new product there? Or do we need to change our pricing model? You know, they hadn't thought through the death of the organization. Most organizations last about 10 years. Right? It's about 10 years. It's worth factoring that in quite early on. It's worth factoring it in. Will it go to heaven? Is it yeah. an organization or a business model? Organization. Organization. <coughs> uh, will it go to heaven? That's a good question. You know, businesses have a social profile in the world. You know, they're not just enclosed citadels. They have a presence in the world. You know, is this a good thing? If your business isn't a force for good, what is it? You know, is it a good business? I mean, it doesn't have to be saintly, but it should be a good business, you know. 10 years, is it because of changing technology or is it just because of people interacting in the company? Uh, I, th I think it's a whole range of issues, but there does seem to be a pattern to it. Um, interestingly, what the, uh, do you know this work by Collins and Porras called uh, Built to Last, about organizations that last for 50 or 100 years? It's quite interesting because they identify what are the key factors in businesses that that's produce longevity. And that's all they're talking about, just longevity. That's not necessarily success, just long-lastingness. I mean, how much is enough? Is that the question? It's enough for me if my business lasts for 100 years. You know, that's a very good, it's good ambition, you know. Um, so anyway, I wanted to give you a sense of what I think are the practical questions that if you're running a business or about to run a business, that I think will equip you better for the reality of it than a lot of questions you typically get asked. Now, it's not to say you, you shouldn't do the strategy analysis, it has to be done, but um, it doesn't equip you very well, you know, and what, what I'm trying to do is write this book which says, look, I think these are the really important questions. If you think about these, you'll be in a much better position not to be surprised by the stuff that really happens out there, which is messy and difficult and strange and is human and chaotic and to do with the politics and so on as well as with some quite fundamental questions like, do you love money? Uh, how much is enough? And so on. <laughs>